The lecture that you are about to see was filmed in the crypt of St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, located under the joy of Al Husaro Cathedral in San Francisco, California. After his blessed repose in 1966, the relics of St. John were interred in this crypt, and they became the source of many miracles. With the blessing of the Holy Synod, a small group of clergy led by the ever-memorable Archbishop Anthony Medvedev gathered in this crypt on October 11, 1993 to open the coffin for the first time. As they lifted the relics out of the coffin with trepidation in the fear of God, they discovered them to be completely incorrupt. During his glorification on July 2, 1994, the relics of St. John were moved to the cathedral and placed in a special shrine, where they remain until this day. Every year, thousands of pilgrims travel to San Francisco from all around the world to venerate and pray before these holy relics, which were discovered in this very crypt. Welcome to this lecture in the pastoral resources program provided by the Eastern American Diocese of the Church Abroad. And allow me just a moment to begin by expressing our thanks to the Fund for Assistance of the Royal Court for its generous sponsorship of the work of the program this year. I would like to speak today on the topic of the Orthodox approach to mission and the transformation of the heart of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How is Orthodox Christianity to envisage and carry out its missionary calling in the world? Well, before trying to answer this very big question, it seems fitting to begin with a few more fundamental ones. And this is so not only because it is good as a general practice to ask why it is that we do certain things, before we engage in the activities of actually doing them and hoping that they will bear fruit, but also because the theme of missionary work, broadly speaking, is one that is very often marred by a drive for action that seems to skip over the need to ask these very fundamental questions. We are often driven by the desire to do something, to do anything. And this is often the impetus behind missionary work which then becomes based too strongly on a vision purely of action. To do mission is to do something. And yet as Orthodox Christians, all of our actions are to be grounded in the truth. And that truth is not a concept, but is Christ himself. And without a knowledge of this truth, all of our actions are shallow, and the fruit they bear is at best scant and small. So if we are to seek practical guidance on orthodox mission, if we are to seek a genuinely orthodox manner to this question, we must start by recognizing that it is not authentic to the practicality of orthodoxy simply to go out and do something for the sake of the gospel. An orthodox approach begins with a heart turning to God, seeking understanding. And so we must ask ourselves the most basic question of all as it relates to this theme. Just what precisely is mission in the mind of the Orthodox Church? Before we attempt to focus ourselves too precisely on how to exercise it, how to accomplish it, we need to look at the concept itself. What is our mission as Orthodox Christians? And what does it mean to be a missionary in an orthodox sense in our contemporary world? Often when we hear these terms, we instinctively, automatically begin to think in the framework provided for us by outside influences. There are many religions that engage in what they call missionary work, and they are often quite visible in this. 
I can think, for example, of an experience that I had last year when the doorbell rang at the church and I went to answer the front door and a group of Mormon missionaries were standing on the doorstep. And they looked at me, dressed exactly like this, though without the clo book, though I had this, the cross in front of me, and they looked squarely at me and then into my face and said, Have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? I was not quite sure how to respond to this question, but it made for an interesting beginning of a dialogue. Very often, however, when we think of missionary work, we think of precisely these sorts of encounters. And our own understanding of what mission is comes to be shaped and influenced by what we see and hear in these others. And in their examples, mission often means telling other people what we believe trying to get them to believe what we do. In effect, the idea of mission is combined with another, that of proselytism, which is the technical term for the work of drawing other people into one's own religion or system of belief. But is this what we mean as Orthodox Christians? Can it be that our mission is, as such examples would suggest, to create more Orthodox Christians, to cause more people to convert. As tempting as such a vision might be, the true testimony of the Church is that the answer to this question is unequivocally no. Creating converts is not our mission, and it cannot be our aim as missionaries in the modern world. But if not this, then what? For this we need not look to the contemporary society with its norms and expectations, even in religious terms. Our mission must not be defined by what the world expects. It must be defined by what the world needs and what God offers into that need. Our source for understanding mission, then, is not in popular action plans or Christian marketing strategies, however pious they might be. Our source is in our past, in our heritage, which is vibrant and alive in our present. Our source is in our fathers, who convey to us the truth of ourselves, of the world, of God, and of his church. And it is by looking to what we receive from the Holy Fathers in the faith that we will learn what is our true mission as Christian people and in what true missionary work might consist. And so we should ask ourselves, what do these divine sources tell us? They tell us something quite clear and powerful. The mission and aim of the Christian life is the salvation of our souls and bodies and the attainment of the kingdom of God. This is first and foremost and is above every other consideration. It is for this that the Father sent His only begotten Son, our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. It is for this that this Lord offered Himself into the world, that He sent the life-creating Spirit, that we who are fallen and broken, suffering and crippled by sin and by death, might rise up by His power and attain to the life that He has fashioned for us, abiding eternally with Him in His heavenly kingdom. We must not forget this. Yet one of the things I feel it very important to stress when talking about mission is that the work of Christian mission precisely does forget just this. And we and you as Orthodox Christians must stalwartly resist this tendency to forget what is the true purpose of our every Christian activity, especially our missionary work. Our aim is not to help the people around us find a more fulfilling life. It is not to help them discover a better form of worship. It is not to help them locate and to become part of a more satisfying religious community. Our mission is to help them find and attain the kingdom of God, to overcome sin by His power, to be transformed into the life of His blessedness. This is our mission as Orthodox Christians. 
And for this reason, it is neither a popular nor an easy one in the world today. And it is important that we recognize this. Mission is often presented as fun, but mission is struggle, as is so much in the Christian life. Though that struggle may, of course, bear reward. To be a missionary is an ascetical endeavor and requires a confident boldness in the face of a world that will resist it. To fulfill this mission, the true mission of the Christian, we must proclaim boldly and without hesitation that there is but one God, not many gods, not many ideologies and spiritualities which the world tries to foster today. To fulfill our mission, we must tell the world that this one God is our God, who does great and wonderful things, that he alone is true and is the truth, and not the endless variety of truths and ideas and wisdoms that the world embraces all around us. To fulfill our mission, we must proclaim into the world that there is such a thing as sin, that there is a right, that there is a wrong, that there is good and there is bad, and it can and should be identified as such, even if the world might call this judgmental. And to fulfill this mis mission, perhaps most importantly of all, we must tell the world that there is a way out of this sin, namely the life in Christ and the mystery of his church. Our mission is to attain the kingdom of God, to draw those around us, even the whole world itself, into that kingdom. To be a missionary, then, is to live our lives in such a manner that these two things are possible, and more than simply possible, so that they actually take place. But how are we to do this? I would like to spend the remainder of my time in this lecture exploring in practical terms what this properly orthodox understanding of mission might mean for each of us as members of his holy church. And indeed, as these lectures are aimed at clergy, at priests, at pastors, speaking in terms that may cause us to act and to lead others around us to act in a manner that reflects our true orthodox life. And the main practical points I would like to consider are these. Three, in fact. The first is that mission depends on developing a burning love through repentance in the mystical life. And second, that mission depends on living a distinctly different manner of life in the world. And thirdly, that mission must be a response to the true needs of the world around us. So firstly, the development of a love through repentance and the mystical life. At the foundation of our, mis of our missionary work in the world is a missionary work that has to start in our own heart. It is a fundamental teaching of the fathers of the church that we cannot share with others what we do not ourselves possess. And so it is a non-starter to believe that we can share with the world a way into the kingdom if we are not working with all of our energy to receive it in our own hearts. The foundation, the very beginning of practical missionary work then, begins in the heart, in your heart, in mine. It begins with repentance. Our hearts must see their brokenness and turn from our sin towards redemption in Christ. Without this, we are seeking to share with the world something that we don't have, and we seek to point the world toward a kingdom that we are not ourselves moving toward or within. And what good can we possibly hope to accomplish? This can never work. If we attempt it, we are like a foolish man attempting to build his house on the sand. As our Lord himself told us, that house will surely fall. But one might ask, how is this understanding of mission beginning in the heart a practical step towards missionary calling and work? And we might answer in this way. It is practical 
in that it defines for us a clear starting point for a life of true missionary activity and power. Missionary work, let me put this very bluntly, begins in the holy mysteries, in confession and communion in the body and blood of Christ. It does not begin in a travel plan or an outline for catechesis. It does not begin in a useful translation of the sacred writings or a manual for encountering people in different circumstances. It does not begin even with an idea for a good Christian bookstore or a coffee shop discussion group. It begins with an epitrachil laid across our head and our heart laid open by the power of the Holy Spirit and the sins that bind us to death and to darkness defeated by the power of God. It begins when through this sacred mystery we are freed of the burden of our sins. We are made ready to draw near to Christ himself in the divine liturgy, receiving in soul and body him who shows us his Father's kingdom. In this way, we can proclaim a truth that is made known to the world by St. Isaac, that the kingdom of God is within you. Then, only then, are we able to share with the world the truth of that kingdom. Open your heart there wholly and completely to God, holding back nothing from Him, so that no corner of your life may remain divided or separated rebellious towards him. Run eagerly as if this confession were as important to you as your own breath, to that mystery by which his power might conquer your sin and draw you out of darkness towards the Son of Righteousness. If this is how we make a practical beginning to our missionary calling, then we will have something far greater than a plan for spreading the word or offering just the right counsel. We will have hearts that are alive and burning with the grace of God. We will have within us that which is promised by our Savior and delivered on the Holy Pentecost. The Holy Spirit himself alive in our hearts, filling our lives, our words and our actions. In the same way that he filled the lives, the words and the actions of those great missionary saints of every generation. This is the Spirit who draws all creation to His Son, who in turn presents it to His Father. This is the Spirit that enables the journey into the kingdom of God. And if we begin with repentance, confession and communion, then we carry within ourselves this Spirit who will find in us a willing partner for the work of drawing the world into the kingdom. We should remember one of the greatest missionary saints of the last century, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, and his famous saying, Acquire the spirit of peace, and a thousand around you will be saved. We cannot assist others in finding their way into the kingdom of God unless our hearts burn with this Holy Spirit. The second key ingredient of a genuinely missionary life is intrinsically tied together with the first, and this is living a distinctly different manner of life in the world. Unless we are freed by the Spirit, given life by Him, freed from our sin, by the mysteries of the Church, our life is always going to be defined by the world, created by it. We will live the life that others live, even if in this way or that we might give it our own flavor. If we dwell first and foremost in the world, if we are shaped by the world, all we can ever show the world is itself, no matter how often we might talk about God or spiritual things. If, however, we are given grace to repentance to live as those in the world but not of it, then we are able by our lives to show the world something different, something strikingly, unexpectedly different. But only if we are truly committed to living the otherworldly life of the gospel. 
As an example of this, I would like to call on an episode from the era of the Apostolic Fathers, who were the immediate successors to the Holy Apostles, and who lived and wrote in what were still the first generations of the Church. At this time, the Church was, in human terms, still relatively young and new. Few people in society yet knew of her. Those who had heard of her rarely knew what she really was, what she actually believed. And there were no convenient introductions to orthodoxy to be read. Even the creed had yet to be written. The only way to learn of the church was to see her, to behold her, to gaze upon the Christians themselves, and thus behold the body of Christ. And what was it that people saw when they looked at the Christians in those early days? Well, we have a way of knowing how to answer that question in the form of an anonymous text written at the time, which offers us a characterization of what one person saw when he beheld the Christian manner of life and how he chose to characterize what he beheld to another. And it is perhaps one of the most beautiful texts ever written. I'd like to read it, though it is slightly lengthy, in its entirety. Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind, either in their locality or in their speech or in their customs. They dwell not somewhere in cities of their own, neither do they use some different language, neither do they live any extraordinary kind of life. Nor again do they possess any invention discovered by any intelligence of study or ingenious men, nor are they masters of any human dogma, as others are. But while they dwell in the cities of the Greeks or the barbarians, as the lot of each is cast, and follow the native customs in terms of dress and food and the other arrangements of life, yet in the constitution of their citizenship, which they set forth, they are marvelously distinct, and they confessedly contradict expectation. They dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens, and yet they endure all hardships as if they were strangers. Every foreign country is a fatherland to them, and yet every fatherland is foreign. They marry like other men, they beget children, but they do not cast away their offspring. They have their meals in common, but not their spouses. They find themselves in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. Their existence is on earth, and yet their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, yet they surpass the laws with their lives. They love all men, even as all men persecute them. They are ignored, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are endued with life. They are poor, and they beg their bread, yet they make many rich. They are in want of everything, and yet they abound in all things. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor they are glorified. They are spoken of as evildoers, and yet they are vindicated. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they show respect. Doing good, they are yet punished as if they did evil. And then being punished, they rejoice as if thereby they were quickened unto life. War is waged against them by the Jews. Persecution is carried out against them by the Greeks. And yet those who hate them cannot identify any reason for their hostility. In a word... What the soul is in the body, this Christians are in the world. Think of how the early Christians must have lived their lives, that one could look at them and say such things as these. And then we must ask ourselves, what kind of life do I live? Am I living my life in such a manner? Will the world look at me and say such things? Or will it look at me and see someone trying to fit in, to be acceptable to the norms and the expectations of the world around me? 
If we are to be genuine missionaries, we must not aim to fit into the world. We must not aim at popularity, at comfort, at acceptability. We must live distinctly different manners of life so that the world might look upon our good works and thereby glorify God who is in heaven. This brings me to my third main point, the need for us to respond to the true needs of the world. It is only when we have a heart transfigured by God's power, when we live a truly Christian life, and bear its witness in the world, that we can then see what the world truly needs, and not simply what it thinks it needs, much less what it wants. It is precisely in seeing the difference between true life and the life of worldly desire that we can point to this dimension or to that and say, aha, it is that which must be cured if my patient is to be well. We can then write. I must repeat that. We can then see this through our lives and the way our lives interact with those of the world. And now, only now, do we have the right tools to enable us to act with wisdom a wisdom that comes from the experience of Christian life and beholding the needs of the world through it, that it is only in this way that this or that activity may authentically meet the needs of those around us. This need may be for instruction, for living in the virtues. It may be for drawing young people to church activities, but not as simply a social activity, but in direct response to the needs of these specific people. Missionary work is always pastoral. It is named, it is aimed not at the world, not at people generically, but at a person, at a person seeking repentance. Our missionary activities may involve organizing alms to give to the poor, to reach out to suffering communities, but again, not as a generic good work or good deed that some might see and be drawn towards our example, but as a concrete response to the needs of those who are suffering, responding to that suffering with grace and the potential to transform it into new life. Only in this way will we construct our missionary activities in a manner that will actually fulfill our orthodox mission, to draw the world around us into the kingdom of God. Sometimes our missionary work will be friendly, casual, even, I suppose, depending on the circumstances, a bit playful. Other times it will be formal, even stark, difficult. Not all patients are treated with the same medicine. And if the same treatments, the same cures, do not work for every disease. If we are true missionaries, then whatever our state in life, whether we are priest or deacon, whether we are lay person, whether we are old or whether we are young, we are participants in the spiritual transformation that the church offers to the world. We are helpers in that spiritual hospital by which souls are saved. As then we live our lives as those called by Christ to let our light shine in the world. Let us strive to remember that in every context, these fundamental realities must guide us as Orthodox Christians seeking to be missionaries in the modern world. Firstly, that we must begin always in our own heart, seeking a burning love through repentance and the sacramental life of the Church. Secondly, that we must seek to live truly orthodox lives, bearing witness to the world of a distinctly different calling, a different way of life. And thirdly, then, in this wonderful life, we must turn to our fellow man, to the whole of God's world, and seek to respond to its needs, that it may join us in this God-given life 
of grace and transformation. The world does not need more generic missionaries. It does not simply need Christian-flavored social work. It does not need it, and it will reject it. But the world desperately needs to be shown the way into the kingdom of God. And each of us may receive the power from God to help the suffering world, to join Christ in offering himself, as the priest says during the proskimidia, for the life of the world, and thus become true missionaries, true lights to our fellow men. May the Lord bless us and all his servants in this holy work. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.